this is Comic Books This Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter, noted comic book anthropologist, and myself, Hannibal Taboo, head comics reviewer at bleedingcool.com. Today we're going to go through a bunch of books that were on stands this week and talk about what we thought about them and, and see what's good and what may not be so good. Stanford, how would you like to begin? Well, let's say we start with DC. Um, we don't yes. got a lot there. Um, that was weird. Because you know, well, you know, this this week, I mean, if you take Batman out the mix, there, there's really not nothing on the shelves. There were ten Batman-related books this week. Ten. It's intense. I mean, I, I'm i sorry. Even if I was... I, I, look, even if I was, a, even if I was like, like, I was like an A number one Batman fan, I still wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't want to see that. I mean, that's just... That's forty dollars worth of say. Batman books, at least, because each book is yeah. like three dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unless unless they do what they did with my with the um, with Static last week, where they only released the uh, the cover with the charges the extra dollar, and, and <laughs> business in the streets. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I say we, I say we start off with with the. With with the other with the other with the other black character, Black Manta. <laughs> That's mean spirited, but I'm gonna let it go. Uh, yes, so uh, Black Manta, uh, he's he's cranky. He's a pirate, and he uh, he wants to do something, and uh, people keep getting in his way. His most trusted person, he calls her a henchwoman or henchman or something. He says she's she says she's nobody to him. He's just kind of rough on around the edges, but uh, yeah, you know he's a. Uh, He's out there doing swimmy stuff, and apparently now, apparently he's descended from ancient Atlanteans, sure, who were weapons masters and went to Africa. Isn't everybody? I mean, technically, yes, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, this one, this one, this one kind of, kind of went out there. <laughs> yeah, I like a lot. I was like, oh, okay. We we so we 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 was Kangs. We was Black Atlanteans now. Okay, all right, sure. Well, it's not just that, but then also, um, also the whole the whole segue over to Themisaria, where where Nubia's in charge now, and now we yeah. have now now we're bringing in another Black character with her with her Orisha flying out flying out of Hades. Um, huh. Yeah, that was that was a little curious. Orisha flying out of Hades. Um, <laughs> I guess if you can mix metaphors, you can mix you can mix pantheons as well. I mean, maybe somebody um, told Orisha to go to hell. I don't know. I, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. This this episode, and and I, I won't lie, I've been I, I love me some Black Manta in the last two ones. This one was just kind of convoluted and really convoluted for an episode or or an issue where not much happened. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, we, we get that little bit that you just mentioned was was like a two page spread of exposition, and then he goes to fight, 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 fight the woman and her Orisha, and that's it's not even. I mean, I wouldn't even say it was a really a, a really robust fight scene, but they did manage to make it take a lot of pages. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> Here, here's 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 my thing, and I was really looking at this. I believe that at the core of this, the conception of this is a bunch of really solid ideas. I believe from an execution standpoint, it's not really connecting the way it needs to. And I don't 100% know why. I don't know if it's... I mean, because for me, everything has to make sense at the outline stage or it doesn't work in the script stage. If it doesn't, right. you know... I, I can't see the outline here. I can only see the final result. And you're right. This is convoluted. And, you know, I love this writer. He's somebody I definitely want to see succeed. But I'm confused. I mean, the only thing I like is Black Manta's dialogue. I, I mean, I think he nails that. He understands the relationships there and the way that works really well. But making that fit into a plot is, it's struggling, you know? I'm, I'm struggling with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just, yeah, I just felt like, like, like this was the issue where, where they got off track. Mm. I mean, I, 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 I enjoyed the the last two issues much more. Yeah. Well, I mean, for me, it'd be a meh for me, but I'm not sure how you'd take that. 
Um, I'm going to give it a low honorable mention because I thought the first two issues were really good. And if, if you drop this issue, you're going to be dropping the series. So I don't gotta, necessarily it, know that's true. I mean, I drop but, issues all day. Oh, yeah, I'm not doing this. But ooh, and then they picked up. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it. I'll, I'm going to give it. I'm going to get it a very, very low honorable mention because because there's still stuff I love in this. That's a very kind review. Very kind. All right, comic books this week with Doctor Stanford Carpenter and Hannibal Taboo. What is next up? Static season one, episode four. Static with a uh, hot streaks of narc now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even know they made suits in smarmy sizes. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, I really love the character work here. I think the character work here, especially between uh, Virgil and his sister, very strong. The relationships here, very strong. A lot of things I like. I, I'm, I'm enjoying the artwork, I'm enjoying some of the creativity and what's happening here. I just want it to move faster a little bit. Is that bad? No, not at all. I'm like we're on, we're we're season one, episode four, and I don't feel like we've gotten very far. And I feel like there are a lot of beats in here that just repeat the beats from 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 previous from yep. from previous issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, this whole like discussion on the front doorstep with the feds. You know, we we, we kind. Of, it already had that happen in not quite the same way, but I, I feel like there's something about this that's just moving very slowly, and especially when you compare it to Hardware and Icon and Rocket. Ooh. <laughs> Icon and Rocket um, don't know; they ain't got no breaks on that book. Right, right. So it's possible to cover more ground, um, and this is another issue where where I feel the same way, somewhat similar to Black to um, Black Manta, where I, I feel like. I, I am not as sold on the art as you are. Okay. Um, and it's not that it's not that. And part of it is that that this the, the, the art that we have does not work really well with a with a ton of dialogue. And there are there's just a lot of work being done in the word balloons. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some of the coloring decisions. Yeah, that's my. Um, that's where I would have an issue. Yeah. They actually make the, they make the story a little bit harder to read, and I, I understand what they are trying to do. But I think that they, I, I, I think that, as my daughter would put it, um, they were doing the most and, and not necessarily in the, in the best way, right? It was just, yeah. it was too, it was, it, I, I just felt kind of like overwhelmed by, by like all the text, all the visuals, the, the um, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have an inherent problem with, with having more of a manga influenced style, mm-hmm. but you know, I feel like I feel like the like the coloring was designed to be really moody, but the style of the art was designed to be really moody, and the moods didn't quite gel. Um, okay, I can totally see that. You know, and I and I feel like we spent a lot of time here just kind of like with exposition. Yes, totally agree exposition with that. about like his his costume and and his um and his yeah and and his. His sand, <laughs> or whatever that stuff is, right? Um, it, it, this is a hard one for me. Yeah, because you know we want these books to succeed. We want these books to be amazing, especially these two. But yeah, it doesn't quite get there. Yeah. What are you gonna give it? Ah, uh, be a very low honorable mention for me. I'd be feeling that kindness that you got going on there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I. Here's the thing. I was kind to Black Manta, so I can't be too kind to this one. Uh, yeah, I can. Low honorable mention. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're doling out kindness here on Comic Books This Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo. What is our next book to review? Ah, uh, well, you know, we doled out some kindness to DC. Let's head over to Marvel. How about Eternals number seven? Oh, no. Okay. Um, well, apparently we learned out they had an electoral process. You know, the 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 eternal electoral college. You know, convened, and that went. You know, about as well as any electoral college, I guess. Right? <laughs> yeah. What? Well, you know what? Ours got us Trump, and this one got them Thanos. So mm, that's 
That's go not figure. too far from the results, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't consider that a spoiler in part because they've been they've been putting all the announcements out, and they've they've had so many announcements about issues coming up in February mm-hmm. that that's that, that actually spoil this whole thing for for everyone anyway. Um, I haven't seen any of them. Oh, I have. Oh, well, you're a noted <laughs> comic book anthropologist. Of course you have. Well, but the, I mean, but I think that that's, that's actually one of the problems here, right? I think that I actually feel like what's happening with Eternals is that they're, now they're trying, they're trying to find some way to fit them into, into, the, into the status quo of the MCU. So we're getting this. It's, same thing's happening with Kane the Conqueror. So we're getting these stories that are kind of revisionist, but kind of not. And mm-hmm. um, I think that at a certain point, you, you just got to accept that they're a different universe and let them go their own separate ways. Revisionist how? Could you clarify that, please? Well, my thing is, why, if we're doing the Eternals, and why are we, why are we working so hard to bring in, uh, to bring in Thanos, right? And already on, but Eternals in the movie space, right? We brought in, we brought in Thanos's relatives. Yep. Um, Thanos spoiler, is spoiler. the big, is the big bad. You know, I mean, um, you know, but it's, it's just, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing that, that they're, you know, they're, they're trying to get the Eternals back in everybody's mindset, um, and and that's very much behind this. That's very much what I feel behind this book. But I, I just feel like they're like somehow they they're just kind of missing the target at the same time, like this story in terms of what we've revealed for, so far, um, you know, in, in Eternals one through one through six, and now we're on episode seven, mm. uh, is that you know that essentially the Eternals are kind of like soul sucking vampires when when they need to be resurrected, they kill a human, right? So now we're now I mean, we're talking. That like, may be oversimplifying and... the point. It's not like they say you and then shoot somebody in the head. You know, it just happens. It's built into the software of the Earth. Right. Well, but that's kind of. I, I don't like that. I don't like that in terms of what it says about the Eternals. I think that. Hard I agree. Think that there, I think that there are some things that you can do to reboot a character that work, and things that you can do to reboot a character that. That that instead of adding, kind of diminish, mm-hmm. diminish the character, and I feel like that that like that element really does that here, right? Oh, this secret that like, you know, and, and the way and, and also the way it comes out, right? Where where Icarus is guarding this boy, right? Mm-hmm. So it so it's kind of like it's kind of like like now when I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, Icarus, baby killer. <laughs> to be fair, see, I don't think that's fair. I mean, I it's mostly factual but i don't believe it's fair <laughs> because it's not fair that's why they shouldn't have done it well no 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 i mean because it's not icarus didn't kill the kid the earth killed the kid so we could have another icarus after icarus got killed he didn't know that he was just going about his icarus business yeah 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 i i, I so hear you if you, you want to know doesn't... who the baby killer is it's the earth Oh, oh, so so let's blame the Earth. Okay. Well, it's the uh, one who did it. So isn't, I mean, isn't that the problem with Kyle Rittenhouse? People are not blaming the person who actually did it. What's the problem? <laughs> too soon? Yeah, yeah. No, it's not too soon as far as I'm concerned. All right. um, you know, I, look, I, I just feel like I, it's an interesting, I think it's a really interesting and powerful plot point, but I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is that I loved about the Eternals as I read this. The, 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 some of their majesty just seems to be gone. Some of the like, some of the grandness seems to be gone in in this iteration. Well, that's interesting because I mean, personally, I never had much feeling for the Eternals one way or another. I liked Cersei because Cersei was a rich, b immortal, th- and c screwed with people, which are all things that I think are awesome. Um, so I've enjoyed, I enjoyed Cersei as an Avenger, but this Cersei, um, sorry, I was mixing up with cinematic, cinematic Cersei is too nice, too nice, but this Cersei is, you know, is, a uh, uh, a bit player, somebody who doesn't even have a big role in it, uh, whereas we're focused on Icarus and Sprite and sometimes Thanos, you know, Druig had a very bad experience, which really he should have seen coming, um, but, you know, it, it's a big, big cast 
and nobody is really getting a chance to shine. And the people right. who are front and center are not shining. They're what's the opposite of shining? Dulling? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. They're not okay. doing, they're not shining. So yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's the problem with that. That's the problem with this book, right? Yeah. Um, and I and I don't think it's, it's pretty, I, it it is, pretty, but I also I think that there's a mismatch here in terms of the art. I don't think that the that the art bring. The, I don't think that the art brings it out. The art is very moody, mm-hmm. and I actually love the art, but I don't know if I love it for for these stories. Yeah, I can check that because Assad Rubik's art. I mean, it's for big mythic, godly characters, but this is a very. This is th- these are very petty gods. These are very petty gods with very small concerns that are freaking out and having personal crises. And that's not it doesn't match the grandeur of of the art while the coloring is as you say super muted, super, you know, turned down. And it's like, turn down for what? I mean, if you got gods on the page, let's do this. Let's go let's right. go all out. Knuck if you buck. So, I don't know. Yeah, it it's a, it's a it is a um, it's a tough one. I mean, I, th- there are things I really like about this. I, I, I like the idea of coming to the Eternals, um, but but we've also talked about some of the other issues. It's like it's like what what are the what are the, what are what is what are the Eternals now that now that the X Men are immortal as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it yeah, I just. I think that, like I said, this story, this story, it's not a bad story, but it's like, I feel like it's falling at the wrong time and it's not being put forth in the right way for this moment. I also think it's interesting that given that they were not given access to the cinematic, so they didn't know what was going to happen in the same way that when they made the Black Panther animated series, they didn't know what was going to happen in the movie. So like, uh, Killmonger's got a mask. Sure. Why not? Um, that, I believe that disconnect is going to do them a disservice. That, you know, most of the world who saw Cersei saw a nice Cersei, not mean, snarky, sarcastic, in my opinion, much more fun Cersei. Did the music Right. But, um, oh, no, it's fine. So not having those things connect. I mean, the Icarus on screen is not a guy that you want to see in the comics. You do not want to see that guy. You do not want him to come here. Um, And that... I believe is going to cause some cognitive dissonance in a way that, you know, the uh, Taskmaster didn't or in the way that Flag Smasher didn't. You know, I actually thought those were upgrades that were very savvy and that made sense. So you could even mantle those in the comics and be fine. But here, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And, and moreover, I'm, I'm concerned that the Celestials, uh, with their kind of absentee landlordism over, over things... Uh, in both cinematic and comics, also is a forgotten point that, you know, there's messed up stuff happening at a large scale and it's too big for the Eternals or anybody else to do about it. And that's something that needs to be factored in. The machine, the Earth itself, as a narrator in the Eternals book, says, I'm not okay. I'm not okay at all. I have problems and nobody is fixing them. And this is not good. So that's, I feel that's, as you say, missed opportunities. It is, and but I also think that um, the Eternals do get more interesting when you have um, the Celestials a little more present, mm-hmm. even if they're just 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 the the threat and mystery of the Celestials actually does a lot to drive the Eternals forward, right? Um, you don't have to have them fighting the Eternals, but just just let them be somewhere. Right now, I I, I feel like this has just devolved into. A story about about different political groups fighting one another, and yeah. the Eternals was always bigger than that. Yeah, uh, and well, it, d- you did see that one shot, the Eternals one shot, where uh, Makari and I forget who was supposed to pr- be the priest character, Ajax. Ajax, thank you. Where they had like kind of a beef, like you know, our gods have abandoned us. Our gods don't care about us. Uh, you know, the, the Celestials are, are, are done. And moreover, they've been proven fallible. The Avengers live in one of them. You know, the, you know, the, the Celestials have been, pardon the phrase, brought down to Earth in a way that I believe does a disservice to the franchise as a whole. Right. I agree. And I think that, I, and, and I wish that they would do something about it. Because I'm trying to figure out what makes the Eternals 
unique and interesting. I feel like I feel like actually in the MCU, the movie universe, they 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 have established something that makes them unique and interesting, right? Yes. Um, but I feel like the, the irony is I feel like they failed to do that in this, and that's not that's not to say that it's a bad book as mm-hmm. far as like being poorly written or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's it, it looks beautiful. The story the, the story is 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 well done, but it just doesn't fit with what the Eternals with, with what the Eternals have historically been within the MCU. So what you're saying is that the problem is not an execution; it's in conception. That it's yes. hard to, no matter how well you do when you execute, if the underlying foundational idea is not solid, you're not going to be able to get very far. Right. I mean, because one of the things that distinguishes a lot of Jack Kirby's work is he had these really big visions. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel like there's a big vision in the comic. I feel mm-hmm. like there's a there's a big-ass vision in the movie. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, but but the Eternals should be showing up and they should be making... Um, making small decisions around small decisions with cosmic implications, mm-hmm. and that's not what we're seeing here. I, I see them just. I see them doing. I see them doing the the, the, the navel gazing that we've come to love, actually, in the X Men. Right? I you never know? loved it. <laughs> but no. But if you, you think about it, like the X Men and to some degree the new, the the Inhumans, right? It's like they're very much about what is my place in this world, right? I was hating the Eternals. That. The Eternals are not asking those types of questions. It's it's kind of like, it's like, what does this mean for the cosmos? So we've taken away the big question, and once you take away the big question, it's like really what 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 separates them, what separates what separates the Eternals and the Deviants conflicts from all the internecine mutant conflicts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then it's like, okay, so the Eternals... So now you're complaining, comparing the Eternals to the X-Men. hmm And they lose. Yeah. Mostly on recognition, because, you know, when right. you think about the Eternals, when you think about the characters of the Eternals, you've got, uh, I guess, like kind of a, a bootleg Superman, I guess, and Cersei flirts with people, as in the comics, and Sprite's, I guess, mischievous and young or something, I don't know. Uh, these are not, like pop out characters and that's no fault of Jack Kirby's because he when he wrote them he was like no this is what Icarus is a nuclear bomb and and Cersei is the all this it was much like uh, uh, the character on American Gods that was played by the character of love you know that's right. one sister so Jack was able to imbue these things we haven't seen that in decades we haven't seen the Eternals be that interesting in decades in the comics well it's something it's also something that that you, what you said just made me think you know and i've said this before that that um to some degree um marvel is psychologically driven and mm-hmm. their the universe their characters tend to be psychologically driven true and the dc characters tend to be archetypes yes. right and um and, and in, even within that structure there's still there's still exceptions that prove the rule so for example batman is the most marvel character in the DCU, mm. and Captain America is the most DCU character in the Marvel universe, Checks right? Out. Right. Okay. So, what what makes the Eternals ultimately interesting is they are essentially DC characters. Huh. Well, well think about it. Like in terms of the, each of their characters is an archetype. Icarus. I mean, they're actually named for gods, right? And there's yeah. this idea that they've interacted historically as if they were gods, yeah. right? Which means that, and each of their characters a homage to an archetype, right? Mm-hmm. And and so what's what? So so now what we have in this storyline, in the conception, right, is they've actually taken taken that that thing that made the Marvel universe, right? Mm-hmm. Is that they weren't really psychologically driven? Mm-hmm. They were driven by cosmic questions. They were archetypes. Yeah. And they've said we're going to turn these archetypes into into human beings with, with 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 rich complex psychology well that's not what we come to the eternals for yeah we got a whole lot of that elsewhere i will ask you with your specific knowledge if i remember correctly the eternals are the consolation prize the jack kirby the new gods were canceled and jack kirby came back to came to marvel to and just said i'll make something like them close enough exactly yeah and and as Jeff Thorne often says, it's hard for the knockoff to beat the original. That if you're going to make knockoff DC characters when you've already got DC characters that were already so iconic, Granny Goodness, Gordon Godfrey, Steppenwolf, and so on and so forth, you know, 
um, that, yeah, it's hard to make Druig pop in the same way. Well, the other thing that I think is interesting is that um, I, I was a participant in some discussions. I, I have not, I still have to do some more fact checking on this, mm -hmm. is that apparently like the Eternals, the, a lot of the characters in the Eternals were actually something that that in Jack Kirby's mind were, were going to be connected to the new gods, and then he left and left and took that stuff over. Uh, I don't know. That's not yeah. my understanding, but maybe that's you know not my understanding either. That was something I was told, and I was like, I was like, the irony is it does kind of make sense. Mm -hmm. Like the, like if you look at the if you look at the Eternals, they they, they very. They have a lot of new gods things, but they also like there's some that take characters the next the next level. But you're right in general. Like this whole idea is you know there, there's so much similarity between the new gods and the Eternals, which is let's face it, that's part. I'm pretty. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the reason why why DC you know um, chickened out on doing their new gods series with Ava DuVernay. Hmm. Hmm. Well. We're getting into we're going down the rabbit hole, but uh, yeah. On this issue, how would you rate it? Uh, I give it a I give it a, a meh. I will share that meh. This is Comic Books this week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo, head comics reviewer at Bleeding Cool. What is next up, Stanford? What say we talk Amazing Spider-Man seventy-eight and then Miles Morales thirty-two? Because they, hey, it's all Spidey Man. Sure, why not? Um, okay, so. <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man is now a corporate trademark owned by the Beyond Corporation. And the man in the suit, because Peter Parker's in a coma, is his clone Ben Riley. Now, we know how many really deep, breathtaking stories Ben Riley has been a part of, which is just yes. like none. Um, and, and this is no exception. Um, I, yeah. There's nothing amazing about Amazing Spider-Man. There's nothing amazing about it at all. It's mm, adequate Spider-Man, maybe, you know, uh, uh, Spider-Man to suffice, but I wouldn't say it's amazing in any way. Yeah, I felt like the art was interesting. Um, you know, Mobius as, as a villain is, I, I think Mobius as a villain is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and we got to, we got to see Misty Knight. Um, but yeah, it, this, this doesn't, this doesn't add up to anything amazing. Yeah. Um, I felt like I, I just kind of got through it. I, it's, I, I'm also kind of weirded out with some of the stuff they're doing with the beyond suit where it heals itself. And in the process, it closes up Ben Riley's wounds. And I'm like, I, I, I came here for Spider-Man, not Iron Man light. And, I mean, and, and if anything, that's my one, that's my one concern about the, about the movies as well. Right. Is like, mm. like I, I'm. I'm there for Spider-Man. I'm not there for Iron Man light. That ship may have sailed, but well, given how many Spider-Man we're going to get shortly, that's hard to say. But um, right. sure, okay. Uh, yeah, I can, I can respect that. I'm not a big fan of this book. I'm not a big fan of what's happening in this direction. Uh, and Ben Riley has never... like The closest to interesting Ben Riley ever was was being Scarlet Spider in Vegas to me. Um, and that was just mildly chuckle-worthy. So... Yeah, uh, this would be a hard meh for me. Yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta give it the same. I mean, I feel like, I feel like I gave him, a, I gave him a chance, but you know. Um, so on to Miles. On to Miles Morales. Oh, am I going first? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> uh, Miles Morales. Uh, has a girlfriend who is the granddaughter of the vulture, and of course, the, the vulture has a black granddaughter because you know why not. Um, and Taskmaster was hired to bring her to a point at a certain time, or he doesn't get paid. Um, and of course, you know, Miles doesn't like that, and the, the girl doesn't like that at all. So they fight back, and yada yada yada. And um, at the end, you know, I just didn't feel like this literally went anywhere. You know, it didn't resolve anything. It didn't give us any new moments. It didn't teach us anything about the characters. It just, you know, it was it was an action ride. It was a roller coaster. I won't deny that. But it was empty calories to me. I agree, but it was still a better experience than Amazing Spider-Man. Well, I mean, if you're going to say, Hannibal, would you rather I sit here and do nothing or would you rather I punch you in the face? 
Absolutely. Sit here and do nothing. But uh, that doesn't mean that that's what I want. Oh, I thought you'd say punch in the face because it involves action. No, no. I, I try to I try to deliver those, not receive them. That's a personal <laughs> thing that I do. But, you know, your mileage may vary. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think... I mean, here's the thing. The nice thing about Miles Morales is he's just an inherently more interesting character, right? Yeah. I mean... What I love, I love the way he goes through the way he goes through costumes. <laughs> you know, it's like it's I like, love the oh. new costume. The new costume uh, is it, dope. Yeah, it's like oh look, some weird spider person kind of thing. It must be Miles Morales. <laughs> you know, it's like must be Miles, right? <laughs> I feel like I recognize him for his changes, not for what he's wearing. That's a little. Um, and you know, I. I actually like this whole thing with the with with the vulture's granddaughter, and I like the idea of the vulture's granddaughter being black, right? Mm. Um, I like it. I like it in part because in comics there's this tendency to ascribe um, virtue to heroes and a lack of virtue to villains, and somehow in comics when it comes when it has to do with with race, one of the one of the virtuous things that that white characters can do is be involved intimately with black people. And, um, and, and like, so there's this weird kind of thing where, where it's like, no, you know, like, like, you know, whether or not, whether or not you are, <laughs> you're accepting of difference is not necessarily tied to whether or not you're going to, you know, what you're going to do with your powers. Um, yeah. I like, I actually like that about the Spider-Man movie. I love that. I, I like that, like, that they had that reveal, mm -hmm. um, and I like that in this. I think it. I think it's interesting, and I and I actually really want to see more of the Vulture's granddaughter's experiences with her granddad. I want to see what the Vulture was like as a granddad. I I don't know why, but somehow this this story and the other stories where she's been there make me want to see that because mm -hmm. I think that that I think that's really interesting writing, right? That, I can dig that it. Like that, like you know. Just because you go out and commit crimes does not mean that you're a bad granddad. That's real talk. That's real talk. Uh, and something I personally relate to. And now I suddenly want this as a Disney Plus series. But uh, <laughs> it's one unlikely because Starling is not the biggest, most thrilling uh, uh, character name that's popped out recently. Uh, and it's not catching on like Gwenpool or whatever. So we are where we are. But that, that being said, I like her relationship with Miles a lot. I like the chemistry they have. I like the, uh, I, I like them as a couple. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. I just want uh, for, <laughs> if, if their lives can't be amazing, could they be spectacular? Is it, I mean, could we, could we do something that's less money? Because we had this whole clone saga with Miles where we had these weird clones and one of them, turned out not to be so bad. I mean, but it, again, it didn't really go anywhere. There was a whole thing where he was kidnapped by this very specific tech thing that was come after him that was never really resolved. You know, there was, they tried to cover it in uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it, the, infinite, uh, the Infinity Stones tie-in one that they did. But even right. there, it was just like, okay, so Iron Man beats this guy. Oh, and we make Iron Man think he's one, and he's an artificial intelligence, so he copied himself to another drive. See ya, suckers! So we still right. don't really know the core of what's happening there. And that's a lot of things that just feel unfinished. Just, you know, like, you know, it's like, f get something done, you know, finish something. Right. And, and I, I, yeah, I agree with you on that. I, th I think that, um, I don't know, I, I, I got to say that the more, the more we talk about Miles Morales, the more, I, the more it just brings out that he is an interesting character that needs to have more done with him. And... He's much more interesting than Peter Parker. I hate to say it. He's got better powers. That too, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I and I like your idea about the Disney Plus series. I, I'll, I'll, I have to give you some props for that. That would, would be totally fun. watch. I would binge the heck out of that. G Grandpa Vulture, give it to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> you could still get the same guy to play him. <laughs> you could. You could. He, I mean, he's done with he's done with his multiverse stuff over DC. He's, yeah, come on. Yep. Let's get to um, Michael Keaton. So yep, my rating Michael on this Keaton. would be a. You know, I'm gonna give it a low honorable mention because it was still like I said, it was a roller coaster, and I was thrilled. And Taskmaster is to me a lot of fun to watch, and as a, a foil, but it 
I, the fact that I know nothing more than I did when I started, I'm like, yeah. And, and that last page thing, I, I wasn't a fan of that. That's which brings me back to the Beyond Corporation. Well, okay, I'm gonna give it. I'm definitely gonna give it a, a mid, a mid, a mid, mid, middle honorable mention. And I'm gonna give him that because I gotta say I did enjoy the whole thing with the Taskmaster. I loved how they're fighting the Taskmaster. I, I just the whole reason why that why that fight stops was so it was funny, but it was so interesting to me. It's real because it because it also helped address you know really how are they gonna beat the Taskmaster? <laughs> I mean, well, well for me. How you gonna the task? Oh, you know I don't need to write this. They're not paying me for that. Um, it shouldn't be difficult for someone with Miles's powers to beat the Taskmaster. It should not be difficult at all. I'm just gonna put it that way. So, okay. Uh, but you know because it, it, once know. it reaches a once it reaches the point where they're in hand to hand combat with the Taskmaster, I'm like, okay, it's over. No, no. <laughs> Taskmaster's a, a guy. He's a guy who works out. Miles Morales can bench press two tons. It's not a it's not a fight, you know. And okay. moreover, Miles Morales can turn invisible. Miles Morales has an electrical sting when you touch him. So, yeah, not really Taskmaster. Not, I mean, I'm just sorry. Task, his whole thing is if I can see you, I can mimic your stuff. If you can see me, oh, okay. Well, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I feel you on that. Still, I, I yeah. I, I, I like the way I liked the resolve on that. The whole thing with the last page, I'm like, okay, I kinda saw this one coming a, like a it. while ago. I don't like it. Yeah. So so let let let's move on to the thing written by Walter Mosley. Walter Mosley comes to comics, yes, yes. Um I'm glad they put up front that they said this is from a different era because <laughs> When Alicia Masters broke out the term trollop, I was like, oh, oh, okay. What are we doing here? What's this all about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, dang. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess. Um, I had to go look that word up. <laughs> but, but, but then, you know, but then he goes on like a dating app. So I was like, wait, what? What's going on here? Um, I think this... I think this needed to be in a graphic novel. I think that, you know, stopping at 20 some odd pages was not the right thing for this because right. this idea doesn't feel like it was built for chapters that way. I agree with you, but at the same time, I have to say Walter Mosley knows how to write a comic. I thought that he knows I how thought to write characters. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I say that in terms of, um, I, you know, and also thinking over to, um, over to Victor Laval, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, usually I, I get a little scared when novelists come over to comics because I, I'm always concerned they're going to overwrite the comic, that they're going to, we're going to get lots of pages with dialogue and lots of text boxes with descriptions of what's happening, right? Like Bendis. And, yes. And not a, not and, a novelist. <laughs> right, but but yeah, and I and I feel like I'm gonna be overwhelmed with that. But I thought what was really interesting is that like the first, I mean, for the thing, like how many how many pages? Like, I I want to say it's like the the first like eight like six to eight pages have like almost no words. Yeah, you know, but you could still tell that Walter Mosley wrote those pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. He. Again, I agree he has a fantastic command of the character. His command of the voice of, of Ben Grimm is fantastic. Um, I just, you know, um, I felt, especially where they took this with the, the dating thing that happened, it felt really kind of for, like we we're really going to push this in a certain direction. And right. I don't necessarily think that does service to it, especially because, okay, this guy who comes out at the end, I'm like, you... Okay, seriously, the thing has gone toe to toe with the Hulk. Who really go to bed? What are you even doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm with you on that, but I still, I, I don't know. I, I felt, I was pleasantly surprised with the writing on this, and maybe, it, and maybe that that actually got me to pay a little less attention to everything else that was going on. Okay, but I, I, I got to say, I enjoyed. I enjoyed the way the way it was set up. I enjoyed having the first. I'm look, I'm re looking at it now. I think it's like ten, 
Um, it's like the first nine pages have mm. like one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven word balloons over the first nine pages. Mm-hmm. And none of the word balloons have more than have have more than four words in them. It's very visual. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that was really nice to that that was really nice. Um, you know, I I. I I felt like this was well structured, you know, well structured as a piece of storytelling. Um, the story, I mean, for me, to be honest, I'm still, it, it's still, I, I don't feel like I've been given enough to decide whether, whether I'm going to enjoy the story, well, you know, and I think that they speaks want money to, nonetheless. <laughs> right. And, and I think that speaks to your comment about, about how this probably should have been a graphic novel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I agree. I agree with you. This would work better as a graphic novel. Just have it be the Walter Mosley thing as opposed to trying to parse it out. But at the same time, I, I'm I'm somewhat impressed with the storytelling. Well, it's it's an honorable mention for me. So I'll I'll give an honorable mention as well. Yeah, we're not going for buying much here. This is comic books this week. We're down to our last 19 minutes or so. What is next up for Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo, head to comics reviewer at Bleeding Cool? Well, let's hit the independent realm. Um, I think we can go through these pretty fast. Um, North Bend, Season 2, Episode 1. I turned the last page of this book and immediately did not remember any of it. I got nothing. I was like, I felt the exact same way. I was like, I read this. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what this book is about. Oh, it's season two, episode number one. But you know what? Maybe you need to tell me what happened in season one if it's if it's if it's going to help me understand season two. Yeah, there's no recap. No recap. Right. Right. I mean, I think that this whole idea of like of like of like numbering comics the way that you would. That you would number a uh, television series, like have, having seasons and then episodes within the season. I think it's interesting, but I think this this here shows us the limitations of that, right? Uh, however, I, I when you say that, my brain immediately jumps to uh, previously on Doom Patrol. You know, like... I, right. <laughs> it's like, okay, here's the stuff that happened, and you need to know this stuff, because this stuff is good. We're going to come out here with flying butts, pal. It's getting weird, and you're going to like it. So. Right. Yeah, I think recaps are, are absolutely a crucial element here that have left out. The reader is left on their own with very little information, with super muted coloring that, you know, makes, to me, every page kind of wash into every other page. And I was just like, oh, okay, I mean, I guess. You know, it happened, but I could not, I, 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 even when I was reading pages, I could not hold on to details because I was losing interest. I don't know why I was there. I don't know what it's about, and I have no idea why I should come back. This book is the king of meh. I'm fine moving on. Yes. So where we got uh, next? Phenoma, Phenom X, number one. Okay, now this, I actually... Well, first of all, uh, it's co-written by John Leguizamo, the actor. And I think one thing that he captured that he really understood was... This needs to be entertaining. We need to have this, you know, people engage with the character a lot. And using humor to do that, I think, was a, a clutch choice. I think that was right. What bothered me was that structurally, this started at one point, started a flashback, and then didn't finish the thought. Right. So, again, it, I know there's more story. I know that you clearly wrote more story or whatever, but you didn't put it in this book. And this book is still X number of dollars. You expect people to pay for it. It's not a complete thing. So finish the thought and, you know, we could do this. this is another graphic novel. Honestly, it's probably a movie treatment that was chopped up um, that we didn't, you know, get to see the whole thing. And, and I'm like, finish a thought. That's always my thing. Finish a thought. All I know is 50, 54 pages and not much happened. Oh my God, that was 54 pages? Yep. Wow. Because the humor really, I, I, like I said, I enjoyed the humor. I enjoyed the humor of the character. I enjoyed the vibe. I actually liked the art quite a bit. Um, but, yeah, wow, 54 pages. Didn't well, okay, well, hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That seems There's like... There's like 12 pages of extras, right, in the back. 
Oh, but I, still, I, yeah, I, that's I how it got to fifty-four. Uh, right, yeah, but it's still, but still, I mean, you take you subtract twelve from that, you're still in the forties. You know, I mean, they didn't. Honestly, I didn't feel like I got twenty-two pages of story in this. I think you're let fair. Al- let alone forty-four. And the reality is, and this this is this is where you know there's this radical like concept called an editor. Ooh. Um, would have really helped. I mean, I felt like there were more words per page. I felt like a, like like they were doing these flashbacks, but then when they came back to the point that they were flashbacking from, they were redundant to what had happened previously when they left to the flashback. You're not it was wrong. Like, You're not wrong. You know, so there's there's a lot of that, and then you know a lot of the same joke being told over and over again. Yeah. This yeah, this could have been a lot shorter. And a lot more interesting. Like, I'm looking at pages where something actually happened to move the plot along. And, you know, quite frankly, this could this could have been an 8 to 10 page story. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, that's not unfair. You know, I mean, I love how they, I, I love how they, um, how they, they have basically, and, and the characters are kind of archetypal, right? Yeah. Or not even archetypal. Um, like they basically, they basically, yeah, they basically have their Amanda Waller character, mm-hmm. right? You know, and I, you know, I, oh, this is going to sound really bad, but I felt like this was created by someone who was trying to create what they thought was a comic as opposed to trying to tell a story. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think that's wrong. Uh, uh, to me, because I see it a lot of times, there are movie pictures that don't get made. And they're like, we still want to make something out of this, so we're going to make it into a comic book. But was it a comic book? Is it a story that fits the comic book format? And here, I think they were trying to make something as a vehicle for Leguizamo that I don't believe translated well here. You know, even with right. I could clearly tell, oh, you wanted Wanda Sykes to be the, your, your, your Amanda Waller type. I get that. Uh, and, and I could see, you know... I can see the specifics of the humor and the way things are played out. I'm like, yeah, I can see the writing here. I can see the seams behind this. But it's not clicking in this format. You have not made it for this format. Right. Yeah. Um, but I don't even know that this would work as a, um, as a movie either. It apparently didn't. <laughs> oh, okay. Too soon? Um, but I mean, I, I'll, I'll honorable mention it because I, I enjoyed the humor. I, I, I never got to a point where I was like, I don't want to be here. Like North Bend, I was like, I don't want to be here. I never got to a point where I was like, I don't want to be here. Uh, I did just get a point like, okay, well, let's, let, you know, let's do something. Let's do something soon. I got to get, I, I'm sorry. I can't roll with you. I got to give it a meh. I respect that. I respect that. I didn't, I didn't count the pages. I may have been more uh, beef if I'd done so. Yeah, I, I tend to do that when I'm opening a file. I'm like, how much time do I have for this? <laughs> what else we got here? Regarding Oswald's body, number one. Regarding Oswald's body made me feel like they picked me up and dipped me in the 60s. Like, they put me in the specific things of this thing. But I don't want to be in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. This is enormously well researched. It's got a great sense of detail in putting together this kind of Ocean's Eleven style cast of, of people to try to address things that are very period accurate. That makes a lot of sense and all, but I don't care. <laughs> I just don't. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Tell I me. I was in love with this cover. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, sometimes sometimes you got sometimes you got to do it for more than love. And that's that's the problem here. I I I love the storyline. I love the idea of sort of an Ocean's Eleven meets conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. I everything's there, but it just there's something about it where, um, you know, I thought the storytelling was 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 pretty solid as well. But they haven't they haven't quite figured out how to make me love the characters. Yes, exactly. you know. So I mean, so the so 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 the Ocean's Eleven type type storyline it works because, oh my God, look at these bizarro, interesting characters all coming together, right? Ah, mm-hmm. uh, these guys aren't interesting. You know, the rich kid who can't who can't get a job with the feds. Okay, you know, I mean, they're, they're just not. They haven't sold me. They they haven't sold me on the on the characters that they're bringing together, and until they can do that. 
why am I here, right? Yep. If you're going to spend the entire... It's like, it's like, it's like we spent, we spent how many? 31 pages, 31 pages interest, introducing me to a room of people who weren't interesting. <laughs> it's kind of rough. But it's still a great story, right? So it's like the theme of the party was great, but the participants, great. the theme of the party was great, but the participant, the people in the room who showed up, eh, not so much. <laughs> I've been to parties like that. I've DJed parties like that. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to meh it and I'm ready to move on because we got 10 minutes left. All right. I'll, I'll give it the, I'm going to give it a, I'm going to give it a high Matt. <laughs> okay. I, I can't force you to read it, but... A rose by any other name. Go ahead. <laughs> Comic books this week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and Hannibal Taboo. What do we got next? Righteous Thirst for Vengeance. You loved this first issue. Yes, I did. And now? Not as good, but still, I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm recommending... I'm, I'm putting this in a, in, a, in a favorable recommendation status. Um, I, I like the, I like that we came back to a, to an opening where it's just sequence without a lot of words. Um, I like that we're not getting into really getting into the head of the character. Like he's not, he's not giving us like his thoughts, mm -hmm. but we're seeing his actions. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, I'm still, I'm, I'm a little confused as to where it's going now in terms of like what these people are doing. But that's also because it ended on the on a really weird cliffhanger that that didn't allow that didn't let me feel like I got to a complete thought. Mm -hmm. Well, I I thought the first issue the plot was way too slow. I think that they responded to that in the second issue by slowing down even further. Um, I uh, I really like the art. I really like the visuals. I really like feeling like I'm walking around in this world. Um, but. I'm kind of getting a kind of a waking life, the movie The Waking Life sort of uh, sense to this, where, like, okay, I'm drifting through this and it's happening to me, but I'm not really sure what's happening. Um, right. I get that there's a criminal connection. I get that the, get that the police are hunting for uh, a killer. I get I get some specific details happening, but those details don't connect with any emotional connection with the characters. And right. that's partially because I'm going page after page after page with... Okay, we're still doing this. Okay. And and frankly, I'm tired. I'm tired of it. Okay. I I can feel you on that. I felt like this was great storytelling. I mean, again, visual storytelling. But, you know, it, it needed to it it needed to give it did need to give me a little bit more. Like I, I think I know where they're going. I don't wanna say it because I don't know whether it's a spoiler or not for me to say it, so I'm yeah, not going to... Yeah, best not to, yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, again, I, I, I think that I think that what you said earlier really applies here about, about you know, incomplete thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the problem. It's an, there's an incomplete... There's a, there's a serious incomplete thought here. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, and they could have completed it with one or two more pages. They could have completed it with a couple more pages... And they didn't have to push the plot further. They just had to give us a little more depth. Or they could have cut some of the navel gazing early on in the issue. Uh, I mean, right. there's a lot of choices that could have been made. Um, this is a very kind of Richard Linkletter approach that I'm not necessarily on board for for comics. I don't believe it fits for the medium. But, you know, we're here. So, for me, it's another meh. I'm going to give an honorable mention. All right. What's next up? Sidekicks, the number six. Six sidekicks of Trigger Keaton. <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is well, the only book I'm recommending to buy this week. Uh, we got to the end of the road. Yeah. What'd you think? It's the only book I'm recommending to buy this week. Um, it's not as good as some of the other issues, but what it doesn't do, it what, it finishes its thoughts. It says, "Here's what's going to happen," and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the end of that thought. Along the way, it entertains at every step there. And, you know, it, it gives, I can see the distinctiveness of each character's voice. I can see the way each one of them walks through the world. And I, I really get the interactions between these characters into an ending that I thought was both inevitable and surprising. Because when they, them clowns showed up on that set, I was like, I do not believe this foolishness. This is fantastic. I want to I I live on that show. 
I, so. I feel the same way you do. I, I did not expect this ending, but once I saw it, I wasn't surprised. Yeah. That is that, that that's good writing. Yeah. You know, that's that's great writing, but I, I also like how the ending still opened the door for 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 season 2. I love right? it. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. It was like, oh no. And it's a season two that you could jump into and like actually understand and not be like you know North Bend whatever. Yeah. Um, you you know, start fresh. It, right. You know what it is? I felt like North Bend. They're trying to they're trying to go to South Bend, Indiana, and took a wrong turn. That's not hard to do. I've avoided going to South Bend many times. Well, yeah, that's called being black. But um, <laughs> you know. If you failed to avoid, if, if 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 you failed to avoid going to South Bend, then we just wouldn't be seeing you no more. Yeah. Um, sidekicks, yeah, sidekicks. I'm gonna give. I'm also gonna give that. Uh, I'm gonna give that a. I'm gonna give it a high honorable mention, low buy. You know, either way, you're buying that one. No, you're not. One of them is buy, and one of them is not buy. That's true. I'll give it a buy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, that's not how buy. That's not how any my of whole works. Point, my, whole, my whole point is I'm putting it on the border between the two, and I want you to buy it. Um, so you want them to buy it? Yeah. So that's a buy. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, words mean I things. I want them to buy it, but I, I, I want to indicate that it's, you know, it's, it's 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 a really good ending. I think they, they stuck the landing, but it was not as interesting as the issues leading up to it. Well, to be fair with comics, and we only have three minutes left, so I'm gonna try. We we have to review the book that's here, not the books that we we think about. It, you know, we have to right. review the material that's on the stand right now. That's true. That's true. And I'm buying. Uh, it. Okay. Well, you go on with your bad self and buy it, and I'll follow and buy it too. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> this is Comic Books of the Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo. Is there anything else that we have not covered? Uh, nothing that we need to cover. I mean, well, there was one. There was one book that I thought was that I thought was was kind of interesting in its conception and also in its storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a book called The Bar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea that there's this bar that people wander into and. They tell their stories. I, I, it's a it's a pretty cool concept. Mm -hmm. um, I like what they did. I like that it was a very simple meat and potato storyline. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see where it goes. There's a couple of twists and turns that they have in there. Um, one one in particular that I don't want to ruin because it's like the last two pages. Definitely don't. Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely an indie book. It's definitely moody. Um, I've, I, I'm going to say I recommend it. I'll, I'll put it in the buy pile. Okay. A buy for the bar. All right. This is Common Books This Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and Hannibal Taboo. Thank you so much for joining us. This will be on YouTube as soon as I can get it edited and put together all the images and whatnot. The jokes 90% of the time are what takes me forever to get this thing done. But <laughs> <laughs> we're back here every Friday now in the lunch hour on the West Coast. And... Uh, we appreciate you. We'll see you next time. Join the It's Complicated Club with the greenhouse over my head if you're looking on Clubhouse. And otherwise, we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. See you later. <laughs>